Good evening and welcome to the CIA at 75, looking back, looking ahead. Thank you for joining us this evening. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Raleigh Flynn, an advisory board member at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. In addition to my involvement supporting the Spy Museum's educational mission, I'm also the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. However, I gained my most valuable experience at the CIA, where I spent 30 years our goal for the next 75 minutes is to provide a sense of the CIA's mission and evolution, explain its unique place in the history of intelligence, share some personal experiences, and then take a brief look at some of the challenges ahead. You'll get unique insights from people who have years of practical analytic, operational, and policy experiences in Washington and overseas. So, I'm looking forward to this discussion tonight with great interest. The Spy Museum's co-sponsors this evening are the Council on Intelligence Issues, CII, and the Central Intelligence Retirees Association, CIRA. I'm now going to turn the program over to my good friend and former colleague, George Jameson, who's the president of CIRA, as well as the president and co-founder of CII, which is a nonprofit educational and service organization that assists CIA officers who need legal help. George is also a retired CIA officer and now an attorney and national security consultant with over 45 years of, of national security experience. George, over to you. Thank you, Raleigh. And thanks to the Spy Museum for agreeing to co-sponsor and host this event on behalf of both the Council on Intelligence Issues and the Central Intelligence Retirees Association. I want to thank also the museum's director of adult education, Amanda Olke, and her team who have been terrific and instrumental in making this happen as they've done so many times before in our joint activities. When CII first proposed this event several months ago, our goal was to highlight in some way CIA's role in serving presidents and the nation for the past 75 years. Through the collaboration of all four organizations represented here, we're very fortunate to be able to hear from such an extraordinary group of highly respected intelligence professionals. Thanks to all of our planners and our speakers, a special thanks to the CIA, and thanks to the over 700 people who registered to attend this event. Now, let me introduce our speaker without further ado, the CIA's chief historian, David Robage. He will begin our program with a brief historical overview to set the stage for what will follow. David has been at CIA since 1989. He worked as a political and leadership analyst on the Middle East, earned a PhD in American history from Columbia, joined the history staff in 1996 and became the CIA's chief historian in 2005. He's taught at George Mason University, currently is teaching at Georgetown and has written a number of classified and unclassified intelligence works, including having publications in, for example, the Journal of Intelligence History and the Oxford Handbook of Intelligence and National Security. His study of George Marshall's use of intelligence will be published soon. One announcement, and then I'll move on. If you have questions, please be patient. We'll have a 15-minute question and answer session after the formal presentations and discussions at the end of about an hour. But we encourage you to write your questions using the Q&A feature on your screens. We'll monitor it to bundle questions as appropriate and pass them along to the speakers. David, over to you. Thank you very much, George, and welcome to all of you who are listening and out there. It's very opportune that we are doing this webinar on Pearl Harbor Day's anniversary, because in many ways, the CIA was formed to prevent that intelligence surprise, a surprise attack from probably the Soviet Union uh, that we had had no warning for. 
what I'm going to do in my introduction here is discuss uh, six major themes that run through agency history, and I hope they will spur some discussion later from the panel. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit about the unique features of the agency and how it has contributed uh, spectacularly to American foreign policy over the years. Let's start out with a basic element of the CIA's identity, which is that it's the United States only full service, strategically oriented, non-departmental intelligence service that works directly for the president. It is full service in that it conducts espionage, offensive and defensive counterintelligence, covert action, all source analysis, science and technology research and development, and overt and covert support services. No other IC intelligence community agency does all of those. Uh, secondly, the agency focuses on providing intelligence about strategic international issues of concern to its principal customers. They are the foreign policy decision makers at the highest levels of the US government. The agency works directly for the president through the National Security Council apparatus, whereas all other intelligence community agencies report to a cabinet secretary uh, in some fashion. The president, therefore, therefore, has always been the agency's first customer, as we like to call him or her. Secondly, the agency has a number of unique authorities that enable it to accomplish its, its missions. Uh, some of these derive from the Central Intelligence Agency Act of 1949, and others come through other authorities. Uh, for example, the agency has pretty much free reign in managing its internal personnel issues uh, and its budget. It has authorities to create proprietary mechanisms, such as Air America, that enable it to do covert missions overseas. It has the authority to admit up to 100 individuals of intelligence interest into the United States each year uh, outside of normal immigration procedures. This enables us to accept defectors, to exfiltrate assets, and to conduct other sorts of uh, operations in support of field activities that are necessary to protect our assets uh, overseas when they get here. Uh, conduct of foreign of covert action. Uh, this is a unique authority for the agency. It's the only organization in the IC that is authorized to conduct co covert action under executive order 12333 at the president's discretion. And lastly, uh, liaising with foreign services, essential partners in conducting missions, as I'll mention a little bit later, CIA station chiefs are the U.S. government's senior intelligence representatives to foreign governments, and at times they've almost functioned as quasi-ambassadors in given situations. Thirdly, the CIA, despite its reputation for clandestinity and covertness, is really the most open secret agency in the world. No other entity in Western democracies or anywhere else in the world is as transparent in its activities and tries to be so through various mandates for disclosure and through voluntary declassifications. Back in the beginning in 1947, Congress, was, or Congress created the CIA by statute in a public debate. Every other service is created behind the scenes uh, in secret. In some countries, you don't even know who the directors are, but in the United States, you have a public confirmation hearing for them. And uniquely, the agency is susceptible to more oversight and accountability mechanisms than any other intelligence service in the world. And I'm not speaking here simply of formal oversight from the congressional committees. I'm talking about other official mechanisms like inspectors general, uh, general counsels. And also we have the unofficial mechanisms, a very vibrant media that's always trying to uncover what's going on behind the scenes. We don't labor here in the United States under an official secrets act. So the media winds up learning more about what we do than in any other country that I can think of. We also have uh, accountability mechanisms such as academ, uh, openness groups, uh, transparency advocates uh, and the like. And you don't find them elsewhere in uh, other countries, official commissions uh, and such. The whole apparatus is very, very different than uh, in other countries. Fourth point I'd like to make is that contrary to public perceptions, uh, the CIA is actually politically weak 
when you compare it to other cabinet level departments, particularly the Defense Department, which uh, controls probably about five, six of the intelligence community's uh, resources. When you think about it, the agency does not have, like other cabinet departments, uh, a constituency out there or lobby groups. Uh, if you recall your old political science training uh, with the Iron Triangle, you have a congressional committee, a lobby group, and then the executive department. Uh, the agency is pretty much out there on its own. Its oversight committees are often hostile, not sympathetic, and it depends heavily on its relationship with the White House for its influence and effectiveness. But that has varied substantially over the years as relations with directors have been either very close, uh, not so close, purely business-like, somewhat strained, or in a couple of cases, almost non-existent. And the agency can't do anything about that because the president can choose to, how he wants to run his national security apparatus and include the agency uh, heavily in decision-making or consider it somewhat of an irrelevancy, irrelevancy or even an annoyance if it keeps telling him what he doesn't want to hear. Fourth point, or fifth point rather, is that the agency has effectively collaborated with other organizations to carry out its missions over the years, but at times these relationships have been somewhat strained. Uh, for example, in the counterintelligence realm, uh, the agency and the FBI have worked very effectively in certain cases to roll up uh, adversary intelligence networks. Think of, for example, the Russian illegals uh, net that was rolled up in 2010. But sometimes we have uh, jostled with the FBI because we have bureaucratic rivalries and we have different institutional cultures and even tradecraft that's caused some strains. Uh, the U.S. military as well. We've been very close to the military in supporting its activities overseas in conflict zones very effectively, but sometimes we tell the military what it doesn't want to hear. Sometimes the military differs with our assessments, for example, in Vietnam over enemy order of battle or in the first Gulf War about bomb damage assessments. But we find that once you get away from the headquarters environment, that out in the field, the collaboration is highly effective. And that's often the case when you get out of the bureaucratic heavens and get down into the field where the work, uh, real work gets done. Liaison services, uh, as mentioned before, very important enablers of espionage and covert action operations. We depend on them heavily for uh, those activities. But we have to recall that they work for governments whose policies and agendas might differ from those of the United States. And so we're always having to reconcile uh, those differences uh, in operations. Lastly, in this area, we don't want to forget the American private sector, which has offered essential assistance to the CIA in numerous projects. Think about, for example, Lockheed with the U-2 and the A-12 reconnaissance aircrafts, a whole slew of contractors involved in the satellite programs, and notably uh, Howard Hughes uh, providing cover for us as we were building the Glomar recovery ship to get the Soviet sub off the Pacific Ocean uh, some decades ago. Last point I wanted to make is that internally, the agency consists of a variety of cultures. We have analysts, we have operators, we have technologists, we have support personnel, we now have data analysts and others in the new digital uh, innovation directorate. Uh, these differences in education and outlook and methodology sometimes create internal cultural barriers and that impeded effective cooperation at times. But over time, the agency has been successful in breaking down these barriers and promoting more of a one intelligence officer uh, culture. It's striking to think back in the agency's early days that operators and analysts rarely shared information, and this was often to the detriment in the operational effectiveness. And in some cases, they were physically separated. They could not enter each other's workspaces uh, and such. But over the years, we've had various mechanisms that have helped break that down a bit, uh, task forces, physical co-location, and the concept of the centers, starting with the Counterterrorism Center in 1986, those have all helped erode uh, these barriers to cooperation. And most notably, to close, uh, since 2015, the mission center concept has fostered even greater collaboration among the now five directorates by co-locating members of all of them and working very hard to make them integrate uh, their various missions. So that gives you a broad overview of some of the major themes that I think are most important in the agency's 75 years. 
And so at this point, I will turn the program over to Mark Lowenthal, who for a time served at the agency as an assistant director for intelligence analysis and production, and currently is now a professor at the Johns Hopkins School for Advanced International Studies. So Mark, uh, over to you, and we look forward to a vibrant panel discussion. Thank you, David. Uh, thanks very much for that. And my panelists are coming on screen now. And while they are, I just want to add a couple of points to David's very fine presentation. Um, it's important to remember that when the CIA was founded in 1947, there was no precedent for a peacetime civilian intelligence agency. It was a brief history of the coordinator of information in 1941, which ended on the night of Pearl Harbor. And to a certain degree, the CIA invented itself largely by being responsive to the needs and preferences of each president. And that is a very important point. Walter Beadle Smith, who was um, Harry Truman's last DCI, probably did more to shape the agency to the one that we know today. The CIA is the president's go-to agency. It is directly responsive to his desires. The CIA is expected to be audacious, but uh, to take risks. But if you take risks, you run the risk of failure. You cannot have a perfect operation the perfect analysis if you're taking risks. The CIA, as David noted, is responsible for a very wide range of activities, analysis, intelligence collection, operations, science and technical developments, and they're all undergirded by the directorate of support, without whom none of this happens. We have um, five CIA veterans joining me today on the panel to discuss these issues. I'll introduce them. Uh, Jim Lawler was a case officer for 25 years specializing in recruiting foreign spies, and we spent well over half of his CIA career battling the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. He was chief of the AQ Khan nuclear takedown team, which resulted in the disruption of one of the most dangerous nuclear weapons networks in history. Jim is the recipient of one of the CIA's Trailblazer Awards. Andy McCretis um, retired last month after a 37 year career of the agency. He served in three different directors, he was president of Bush, uh, the 40, Bush 43's briefer for three years. He led the Weapons and Counter Proliferation Mission Center and was the associate deputy director in the Directorate of Science and Technology. He spent the last four years as the agency's chief operating officer, the number three position in the agency. John McLaughlin was a career CIA analyst and um, served successively as chairman of the National Intelligence Council, deputy director for intelligence, deputy DCI, and acting DCI. Bill Murray is a retired senior intelligence officer. He led CIA operations in several overseas locations, including during crises, war, and civil insurrections. He also assisted in drafting the legislation that resulted in the largest reorganization of US intelligence since 1947. He is currently the founder and managing member of the Alfam Group. And finally, Don Myricks recently retired as the deputy director for science and technology. Don now pursues mission through um, board work focused on dual use technology. She pairs this with her passion of give back to the community via commissions, red teams, community focused charities, and leadership education. And we thank them all for uh, spending the evening with us. So we obviously are not going to cover all 75 years in depth in the next uh, several minutes. But what we want to do is to give the audience a sense of what those 75 years have meant. People most often think of espionage when they think of the CIA. That's probably a good place to start. So Bill, why don't you lead us off uh, with that? Thanks, Mark. Um, I, I thought about this in, in terms of trying to figure out one story that would kind of <clears throat> encapsulate everything that we do at the level of the recruitment and handling of human sources and human spies. <laughs> and the story that comes to mind took place in Beirut uh, during the Civil War. Um, we learned of a particular individual. He was a terrorist um, who had been badly wounded in a terrorist action uh, by, his own, by some of his own buddies. And he was in a hospital and he was basically dying. He was going to die if he stayed there unless he got to Europe somehow and got treatment that wasn't available. Um, we took a risk and we recruited him. And we made a deal with him. And we sent him to Europe, and he recuperated uh, remarkably well. Uh, if 
I, I couldn't even begin to describe the extent of his injuries, but basically we're talking about bone grafts and everything else to get him back on his feet. We recruited him, sent him back into the milieu that he had come from. And then we had a, a number of operational problems. Number one, handling him, uh, trying to keep him from committing mass murder, which is what he had done most of his life. Um, and also trying to figure out a way to communicate with him. He's living in a remote village in the mountains. There was no technical way that we could use any kind of technical system to communicate with him. So we had to figure out some low tech, but effective methods of communication. But the biggest problem was he lived in an area we couldn't go to, and we lived in an area that he couldn't go to. So we had to find an intermediary that was capable of crossing the dividing line at that time, the, the so-called green line in Beirut. And the intermediary was his mother, who was a matronly figure, um, very heavy. Um, but she was able to go back and forth. And we worked out a system where she could notify us using a, a, a simple telephone system to another intermediary who was living in West Beirut, alert us that she was coming across. We could then send instructions back and forth through a pearl quarter with um, tiny little tapes. And in order to make sure that he actually erased whatever messages we sent to him, he, he was illiterate, by the way. He couldn't read or write. That was another, another problem, trying to communicate with him. Uh, but this guy had participated in events that included the deaths of foreigners. It included kidnapping of foreigners, et cetera. And he was very close to Islamic Jihad, which was then responsible for the kidnapping of thousands of Lebanese and more than 17 foreign um, individuals, including a number of Americans, um, and the death of some of them, Father Jenko and others died in captivity. Anyway, so it was pretty important to try to deal with this guy. Um, you can't actually get to or recruit people in the central Islamic Jihad milieu because they're sort of like Tony Soprano's gang. They grew up together. Matter of fact, most of them had been members of the same Nasser social soccer club when they were 12 years old. These guys were married to one another's sisters. Uh, they were very close to one another. They saw one another virtually every day. There's no way you're going to get to any of them. So you have to get to the peripheral people that they deal with. And this particular individual was one of those peripheral people. So anyway, the intermediary is his mother. And she would come across the green line for medical treatment in East Beirut. Um, and she would strap the cassettes and various devices that he would send us and the information that he would send us to the inside of her thighs and come across the green line draped in copious black material and a, and a hijab and et cetera. Come across, we'd meet her, we'd talk to her in Arabic. We had our Arabic speaking officers and handled her. Um, and then we'd load him up with what he needed, which was, as you might imagine, money um, and also ammunition. Um, he couldn't, the, the poor quality of the sort of self made reloaded ammunition in his area was extremely dangerous, sometimes caused guns to blow up and things like that. He needed it mainly to just to protect himself at that point in time. But we, we, we carried this on for several years. Um, about a month after we recruited him, we got the first Amer and got him back into play. We got the first emergency message that she wanted a meeting. And you look at this thing and you say, we've taken an incredible risk. We've spent a lot of money. We've got a human asset. We have no idea what he's going to be able to give us. But we're hoping that he'll be able to give us early warning of a terrorist attack. Anyway, about a month after we got him back into play, we got a message that she wanted a meeting. We went to the, we went and saw her. And she said, Islamic Jihad has buried a reconfigured tank mine in a, in a roadbed in Beirut, and they're going to command detonate it because they know that the American ambassador is crossing the green line to go to a meeting with a Sunni functionary in West Beirut next Tuesday. So <laughs> we, we then had to figure out a way to alert the ambassador, first of all, divert and prevent the explosion, and also, but not alert 
Islamic Jihad, Imad Mugnir and his friends to the fact that we knew about the explosive. So we worked something out where the ambassador was able to change the venue of the meeting and the Sunni figure that he was meeting with agreed to a new meeting place and we were able to avoid that road. The next problem I had was how do I prevent that explosion being used from some by some on some other ambassador, the West German, the British, the French, because people go back and forth, ambassador level people went back and forth for meetings. So what I finally did is to find a way to contact Ghazi Khanan, who was the Syrian intelligence officer who was actually in charge of West Beirut at that point in time. And I passed, passed the message to Ghazi that his friends in Hezbollah, uh, Islamic Jihad, had buried an explosive in the roadway and they were going to blow it up and et cetera. And we were able to defuse it. It's not the only instance, but it no, of course not. that I can think of, but it involves every aspect of what we do. Spot mm -hmm. assess, develop, recruit, and handle an asset. Um, yeah, thank you. Let me let me go over to Jim. Jim, you you did a lot of human source recruiting when you were taking down the AQ Pi network. Tell us about that. Well, we uh, discovered the uh, network actually through uh, creating another entity. We were going after an entirely different proliferant country, uh, another rogue state that was seeking nuclear weapons. And we created an entity out somewhere in the Middle East where we figured that we would attract some, uh, well, customers for uh, so that we could then collect information. And sure enough, who should come across our screen but elements of Dr. A.Q. Khan's uh, human network. Now, Dr. Khan had been uh, largely a uh, procurement person. He was a metallurgist educated in the Netherlands, and he had worked for the Uranium Enrichment Corporation that developed uh, high, highly uh, sophisticated ultra centrifuges for the enrichment of uranium. And if you enrich uranium to about 3.7%, that's fine for a nuclear reactor but you can use the same centrifuges to continue to enrich the uh, uranium up to what we call a weapons grade of 80 or 90%. It's the same technology, just extra plumbing. And we discovered that Dr. Khan, who had basically stolen these designs from Europe and taken them to Pakistan in the late seventies and given Pakistan a nuclear weapons capability, he was now taking proliferation private. Now this was the first time the agency had ever seen an individual take proliferation private. We had seen proliferation between nations from one nation to another nation, but not an, a super empowered individual like Dr. Khan, who basically controlled what was known as Khan Research Laboratory in Kahuta in Pakistan, and was all by many people considered the father of the Islamic bomb. He had basically given Pakistan its deterrent capability against India. India had, de had de detonated a bomb in 1974, and the Pakistanis were bound to determine that they would have a deterrent against their arch enemy. And Dr. Khan, to his credit, gave them that capability. But long about in the late 90s, he decided for either narcissistic reasons or whatever, money was part of it, that he would then take that technology and sell it to other countries. This had no official Pakistani government uh, coordination or blessing. They were largely ignorant of his efforts. But since he controlled the factory that made this equipment, it was like, uh, you know, if Henry Ford wants something from Ford Motor Company, he gets it. Well, if Dr. Khan wanted something, he got it. He created front companies. He created all kinds of networks out there to do this. And my team came across the elements, some very essential elements of his team, and we developed a very slow penetration of this network. It went on for about seven or eight years, and finally, we were able to develop enough information based on signals intelligence, based on cyber penetrations, and based ultimately on recruitments of human members of this network that we had absolute smoking gun proof that he was providing nuclear weapons, a full turnkey nuclear weapons capability to Libya. Now, this was, like I said, in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, Libya at that time was considered to be and was a state sponsor of terrorism. It was led by this lunatic, Muammar Gaddafi. And we thought, you know, if, if Gaddafi gets a nuclear weapon, and this was, by the way, a very 
effective proven nuclear weapon. It's one that is estimated to have a yield of 14 kilotons. That's 14,000 tons of TNT, the same yield that Little Boy had when it developed, when it destroyed Hiroshima in 1945 and killed 140,000 people. So we're talking about a proven design, one that will work. And Dr. Khan was basically going to, was in the process of selling that to the Libyan government. Thanks. This was uh, this was a here, showstopper. Please. This is what this is what I lost hair over this. I mean, <laughs> this this is something we have never seen anything like this before. When I briefed uh, Director George Tenet and others, they were astounded. I remember I had the designs of a fourteen kiloton <laughs> nuclear weapon, and I put it in front of one senior CIA officer. I explained to him what it was, and he sat back from it as if it were a rattlesnake that was going to bite him. And he controlled a lot of my resources, but he looked me in the eyes and he said, Jim, you can have anything you want. <laughs> and we were very effective in disarming Muammar Gaddafi. Yeah, we, um... the, the penetrations that we uh, were able to recruit inside the network basically tipped us off to a major shipment of uranium enrichment equipment on the BBC China. The BBC China, thanks to our intelligence that we gathered, was able to be diverted in the Mediterranean to the uh, southern port of uh, Italian port of Toronto. And we offloaded five 40-foot containers of nuclear equipment, thousands, hundreds of thousands of pieces of nuclear equipment. It was the largest nuclear, um, you know, basically a seizure of nuclear equipment in history. Now at the same time, and I know you're going to go on to this, Mark, in a moment, then there was our negotiating team mm -hmm. that was talking to Gaddafi and his people. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi in one of his more lucid moments decided that perhaps it would be better to be a friend of the United States than an enemy, having seen what was happening to his Arab cousin, Saddam. And so he had put out feelers to the CIA what would it take for us to normalize relations with the United States? Uh, their oil and gas production capability was choking. Uh, they needed the latest oil field technology, which we controlled. And he didn't want to see Libya be a victim like Iraq was being invaded. And so they reached out to CIA and a very talented team of officers led by um, the Associate Deputy Director of Operations, Steve Kappas, and some other people started negotiations with our fundamental bottom line demand, you have to give up all of your weapons of mass destruction programs. He said, okay, we'll clean the slate. Unfortunately, that did not translate down to some of the Libyan negotiators who either were on the take or weren't quite sure they were hearing the, the absolute ironclad bottom line truth from the great leader and they were stonewalling, especially on the nuclear program. And they kept telling our negotiators, we have nothing but a peaceful nuclear reactor at Tajura, nothing else. We don't have a nuclear program. Well, after we seized those five 40 foot containers of nuclear components, one of our negotiators asked them, then how do you explain those five 40 foot containers that we just took off of the boat, BBC China, which, is which right now is sitting in Tripoli Harbor? He said, you could have heard a dime drop. They asked for a recess. And about two hours later, they came back in and said, by gosh, you're right. We do have a nuclear program. And after that, it led very quickly to uh, them declaring the nuclear program. We got the equipment out of there by December of that year, December of 2003. And so we basically disarmed Libya. Now that sounds fine historically that we were able to take those nuclear weapons away from Libya in 2003. A friend of mine, though, about eight years later, when Gaddafi was being overthrown, reminded me of what our team had done, what the CIA had done. And he said, just imagine if you had not taken away those nuclear weapon capabilities from Gaddafi. When he was being overthrown, he could have used those weapons on his own people or created a diversion, a distraction in Europe and used it on some European city. I hadn't yeah. really given that that type of thought. John, do you I, want to add anything to the, to the Libya story? I think Jim has told the uh, whole story, really. The only thing I would add is we first were tipped to Gaddafi's uh, desire to go in this direction. It came to me in 1999 in a conversation with 
the then Saudi ambassador to the United States, Bandar, Ambassador Bandar, Prince Bandar. And he said to me, he'd had a conversation with Gaddafi and Gaddafi had said, I'm tired of being a pariah. I have to find some way out of this box. And we thought about that over the years. And then when Jim came upon this opportunity to take down the AQ Khan network, and we realized there was an entry point into Gaddafi's world here, and we knew his attitude, that was one of the things that, uh, uh, that affected it. The other story I would tell connected to this is as we were talking to the lower program officers that Jim referred to, who generally did resist initially Gaddafi's mandate to get rid of these weapons, uh, the same thing happened with his missile program. And they said, well, we only have Scud's, t Scud's uh, Bs, but in our collection program, we had also discovered that they had the longer range Scud, the Scud Cs. And when we were able to confront them with that, once again, as with the nuclear program, um, their resistance went away. But uh, our team that was out there doing these negotiations did a terrific job. And right, this is also an excellent example of opportunity analysis. We, we think about intelligence and warning, but one of our jobs is to tell the president and other people, you say you wanna get this done, we think there's an opening here where you can get this done. And, and it's really a very important part of what intelligence services do. Um, and I have to say the debrief from Steve Kappas was one of the most fascinating debriefs I ever sat through. Uh, Dawn, let's, let's turn to, to technical collection. The CIA has a responsibility for a range of technical collection activities and has often been a pioneer in this area. So tell us a bit about that. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the opportunity to be part of this uh, August panel tonight. Um, so David already spoke to the original reason the CIA was established, which was really to ensure that there wasn't a nuclear Pearl Harbor at some point. And so as that was happening uh, kind of in the late 50s, early 60s, um, we had a couple of what I'll call in the, what we call in the s &T, hold my beer moments, which is people kind of said to us, you can't possibly be able to collect against, you know, Soviet ICBMs and characterize. And, and we said, no, actually, we probably can figure out a way to do that. So in partnership with DOD, um, we decided that we pursued two tracks, basically one from uh, an airborne perspective and one from a space perspective. And both of those were highly speculative. We did have the U-2, but it, we, it turned out it had been tracked by the Soviets from its very first flight from, from the outset. So there was a decision made that what we really needed was something that could travel at the speed of a rifle bullet at the, at the edge of space. And that spawned the ox cart, which led to the SR-71. But at, at that particular point in time, there was a lot of unknown unknowns that had to be addressed from an engineering perspective. And I won't go through that. If people are interested, we can talk about it in the Q&A because I can drone on at length about all of the problems. But it really was the, the um, uh, caused all sorts of new technologies to be um, uh, put together that ended up underpinning Air, for Air Force and air power for the last 60 years. So that was fascinating. The thing I wanted to talk about was we actually had to build a test range because there wasn't anything, there was nothing in existence where we could do a clandestine program build out that had the runway, the capability, all of that. So, you know, in partnership with the Air Force and DS and others, um, these programs were incredible in terms of it wasn't just the technical problems, it was everything that went th th with them. It was uh, developing cover for, you know, those sorts of things. And, and in fact, a small city was put in place in the space of about 10 months in order to do the test program for this particular um, capability that resulted in an SR-71. And, and I always like to tell the human piece that, that you know, um, when they finished, it was Lockheed was the prime. And when they finished the first test article and were trying to get it to the site that had been built, um, as they were moving it, they had to close down roads and they moved it at night for a whole bunch of reasons. Well, it actually grazed a bus or maybe a buzz, bus grazed it in transit. <laughs> And the agency ended up just writing a qu very quietly a check for $5,000 to make it go away. And in all of these stories, you know, there's always the human piece where something happens and shows up. And, and there all of these have many, many of those sorts of things, but a great example of a capability. And oh, by the way, by the time it was operation, declared operationally ready, of course, the Soviet capabilities had been much improved. And so it ended up being used a lot for SSM evaluation in Vietnam and for North Korea tracking down the Pueblo and things like that. So, you know, hats off to the um, Congress and the staffers who put the money in, but also to the executive branch for having the intestinal fortitude to figure out how to use this thing um, and then grow it. 
for the implications that it had for the future of air. And then I'll, I'll hit on Corona very, very briefly because that was the thing that actually obviated why we were gonna use the, the ox cart over Russia to a large extent was we actually were able to put together the capability to take photographs in IR infrared um, from space in a way that it was timely. Uh, we wouldn't consider it timely today, but at the time um, we could actually do a launch take film, it was literally film, although it was a special kind of film that had to be detected, and then put it back down for re-entry where it would be snagged by an airplane as it was dropping at 33 feet for, per second. So a whole bunch of interesting technologies again came out of that. Um, it, it was very interesting in that in the first 30 missions that, that uh, it was put up against, only 12 were deemed productive. Think about that in today's environment. If you had less than a 50% success ratio for a major acquisition, how long would that survive? But that, that you know, it was it was eye-watering. By um, June of 1964, every single one of the Soviet ICBM sites had been photographed and had they in the first couple of productive missions, the corona had actually generated more coverage than in all the U-2 flights up to that point combined. So pretty amazing. And I'll tell one more story there that um it actually some of the flights that didn't go were either because there was a train that was a pub, was on public land through Vandenberg. So the flights had to be booked around the train ingress, egress. And, um, and originally as part of the cover story was, you know, the impact of space environment on mice and things like that. And the SPCA actually got complaints about the fact that the CIA <laughs> might be killing mice. So <laughs> they had to replan those and they didn't actually go off the way they were expected. But um, there's there's always those interesting. So after even after everything else has worked out, there's always those aspects of these really complex missions that kind of gets an all hands on deck and gets people like John engaged. Just like, wait, I got to go talk to the SPCA about mice. Um, yes, sir. Actually, do or you got to be prepared for that phone call should it come in. So love those stories. And in both cases, you know, hats off to the executive branch for the support, the agency for pulling it all together, our partners but also the executive branch were having the intestinal fortitude to, to stick to programs like yeah. that, that were really, really speculative at that point. And Congress as well. I mean, the first 30, it was flight 13 where the first Corona actually worked in. And I can't imagine going up to the Hill these days and saying, now, Senator, I know we've had 12 bad launches, but I'm feeling really lucky about this one. And I say <laughs> that as a former staffer, when the first Corona flights came back, the first mission uh, photos came back, Alan Dulles, who loved operations and nothing else, said, you're taking all the fun out of intelligence. And Richard Helms, who, who was not in favor initially of Corona, said, we've been working with blinders our entire lives. He understood this. And Dulles, it wasn't what appealed to Dulles. Um, thanks, Dawn. Collection obviously leads to analysis, trying to make sense of all this information that is intelligence is coming back and what may happen. And again, there is a degree of uncertainty in this that has to be conveyed to the policymaker. Andy, give us uh, some examples of that, if you would. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so, you know, I think it works best. And, and the examples that, you know, Jim talked about, both AQCON and, and uh, Libya, you know, it works best when there's an integration. It's a two-way street between collectors and analysts, not the, here, I just collect some information. I'm going to dump it over the transom. You go figure out what it is. Um, and so that that two-way street is really the magic in this. And that's what, you know, I think that's where things work best. Um, you know, there's a lot of examples throughout uh, the agency history. You know, one that comes to mind that we can talk about uh, took place in 2007. And, and in 2007, we, um, through a liaison partner, we acquired some photographs of the inside of a, a building, suspicious looking photographs. And the building was, um, the liaison partner told us the building was in Syria in the Eastern desert in Syria. Um, and we saw both internal photos and ground photos of the outside. Now the outside of the building um, looked like, of course, I didn't know what a data center looked like in 2007, <laughs> but today, when I think about that building, it looks like one of today's data centers you see out here in Ashburn. Um, and so it was a sort of an innocuous kind of building. It was built in a, in a wadi, in a depression. You couldn't actually see it from a road that was only a couple hundred yards away. So if you drove by, you wouldn't know it was there. Um, and so, you know, we were sort of stuck with a, you know, what could this be? Uh, the, my analysts, when they saw the internal of the building, uh, they said to me, this is Yongbyong. Uh, Yongbyong is the nuclear reactor in North Korea. 
Uh, so now all of a sudden we're talking about Syrian desert, North Korean nuclear reactor, and this is three years after Iraq. And so the environment, the, the, the policymaker environment was very, um, it was very charged. And so we went through probably some of the most rigorous work between collectors and analysts to, you know, try to, to drive out as many of those uncertainties that you mentioned, Mark, um, to, to be relatively certain about what we were looking at and to also make sure we caveated it for the policymakers. In this case, we were just talking to the president at first, what this is, what we thought it was, what it could be, and what are the chances it was one of these other things. Now, the building in itself, you know, from the outside, by the time we sort of really got a look at it through national technical means, you couldn't tell anything because it was a box, just a you know big box kind of thing. Um, had no power running to it. So right away, there's like, hmm, why would you have a building like this with no power running to it? There was a pump house uh, being built nearby because the, the facility was right near the Euphrates River. And so it looked like the pump house was, was going to take water in and out of this building. So all of a sudden these pieces begin to fall into place. You know, you don't need power because you're gonna generate your own power. You need to be able to remove heat. So you're gonna run water in and then run water out. Um, and the effort between, it's one of the closest efforts I've seen between analysts and collectors going back and forth and bouncing ideas back and forth and coming up with clever ways uh, including the DS and T to figure out how do we enhance our collection so that we can go tell policymakers what we think this really is. Ultimately, it it was in fact the North Koreans building a plutonium producing nuclear reactor in Syria. Not you know this is eastern Syria. It's in the middle of the desert. There's nothing there. Um, we had scant evidence before that. You know we had North Koreans sort of in and out of Syria, but but there wasn't. They were they did a great job with denial deception. Uh, using security, communication security. So we only had, you know, just a flicker of something, but but no location, no place to go look. Um, so it turns out that it's, a, in fact, a nuclear reactor. We um, went to brief President Bush. This was after I was a briefer. And that was sort of an interesting discussion with him um, because I had been there during Iraq, right? And so this was, you know, a session where we really had to walk through everything we had done to determine what it was that we were seeing. Uh, General Hayden was the director at the time. And uh, uh, the, the little moniker that uh, General Hayden started using on this was uh, no core, no war. And so uh, with the idea that if this thing you know, went critical, um, that could result in a war between Syria and, and Israel most likely. Um, Fortunately, the, we were correct on the facility. It was destroyed probably within weeks of it becoming operational. And at, that's at the moment we all braced ourselves because we thought that also could lead to conflict. And the unexpected happened. The Syrians buried it and pretended nothing happened. So they covered it up with dirt and never said another word about it, which was not something we had anticipated. Um, however, I think it... You know, as I look back on, there are a lot of successes in the agency history, some of them we can talk about that we talked about tonight, others that, you know, we just sort of can't discuss. You know, this one stands out because of the time period and the kind of relationships that were built back and forth. And you, there has to be a separation between collectors and analysts because you don't want analysts overly influencing collections. So it's not just make it all a free for all and everyone gets access to everything, right? And you have to protect sources and methods. But this is one where I think you know, collectively the agency just walked to just exactly the right line to get to a conclusion that had significant national implications. Just to close, that location in Eastern Syria would have been part of um, ISIS territory just a couple of years ago. So that would have, now of course the Syrians would have fought for it if, they, if there was a nuclear reactor there, but regardless that would have been part of the so-called caliphate in Eastern Syria. So you can imagine that whole scenario playing out because by that time it would have produced quite a bit of plutonium you know, from 2007 to just a couple of years ago they would have gone through several cycles and been able to produce plutonium so um that one that one i think is a is an example of how this works best right and it's a great example of the operators collectors and analysts working together not in, not not separately 
analysis doesn't always go correctly. Um, several of us on this panel were involved with the Iraq weapons of mass destruction estimate in October 2002. There was an earlier estimate during the Cuban Missile Crisis that is sort of a poster trial for how not to write analysis. John, talk a little bit about that one. Yeah, that's a really interesting case, Mark, and it's uh, another instance of something Don was talking about earlier, which is there's almost never a straight line through these stories. This was, of course, the closest the world has ever come to a nuclear holocaust, and the agency's role in it is marked with both failure and success, uh, overall success at the end of it, but certainly a failure at the beginning of it. When an estimate was done, an estimate is a paper that pulls together the views of the community on a big issue. Uh, the, the paper that was done prior to the discovery of missiles in uh, Cuba concluded, um, CIA paper, that the Soviets probably wouldn't put missiles in Cuba because it just wasn't in their interest. And the mistake there, I think, was to think of the Soviets in rational actor terms at that time. Now, on the other side of the coin, all of the uh, Soviet specialists in Europe or in uh, the United States, the famous ones of that era, uh, Charles Bolin and so forth, uh, all agreed that the Soviets wouldn't do that. The backstory here, though, is that the analysts who wrote that paper did so without benefit of the U-2 photographs that ultimately revealed the presence of those missiles. And why is that? And here's where the line gets a little crooked. The um, White House and the State Department had opposed the U-2 flights over Cuba in August. Mm -hmm. the missile crisis happens in October. In August and September, on the fear that the uh, Cubans would be able to shoot them down and a big international incident would come about. Long story there. But at the end of the day, uh, the analyst wrote this paper um, without benefit of the U-2 flights that resumed on October 14th. And by October 15th, the analysts at CIA had looked at those photographs and said, those are medium range missiles. Now it's a much longer story because there's a human story, human agent story dimension to this too. Um, in identifying those missiles, of course, the CIA was working with Oleg Penkovsky, who a uh, Soviet agent who had given us essentially the manuals for what a missile base looked like uh, for the Soviet Union. And analysts were able to take that human intelligence and apply it to what they were seeing in the U-2 photographs. And in the end of the day, uh, and by the way, the, the, the record of all of this is very clear in a book called The Kennedy Tapes. These were all, these conversations were all recorded. And you can see the back and forth between the analysts and the president and the cabinet officials who were in the room as they discussed what these things were the analysts acquitted themselves very well in, in coming to the conclusion that these were medium range uh, nuclear tipped uh, Soviet missiles. There's another little footnote in this story, which is um, fascinating to me, which is that we never discovered that there were also large numbers of uh, tactical uh, nuclear weapons in Cuba, Soviet tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, didn't know at the time. And one could look at that as an intelligence failure, but I've often wondered too, had we discovered that, could this have been brought to the successful conclusion that it was because we would never have been able to document and monitor the removal of tactical nuclear weapons in the way that we were able with the U-2 photographs to track the dismantling of these missiles and see them removed. In the end of the day, uh, the president managed this well, the CIA managed its involvement very well, and, uh, and yet it did begin with what might be seen as an analytic failure, although one also very much enabled by the absence of collection that it could have had. All right. Yeah, Sherman Kent, who was responsible for estimates in those days, after the fact said, the estimate was right, Khrushchev was wrong which is a slightly arrogant take on the entire issue. Let's turn to um, covert action. As uh, David said, the CIA is responsible for covert action. Covert action is when the United States makes efforts to change conditions in a foreign country um, without it being apparent or evident that it's us. And this, um, there is actually a portion of law that describes the secret activity, which is sort of amusing. We've had some successes, the Italian election in 1948, the Iranian coup in 1953, um, we've had some failures, the Bay of Pigs, the effort in Indonesia. This is the riskiest activity. Uh, Richard Helms once said to, to me and to my staff on the Hill, 
you go up to Capitol Hill because you run spies and you run covert action. And this is where you run into trouble. Um, we had a long-standing program in Afghanistan. And Bill, you were involved in the Afghan program. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, the, the Afghan program lasted for 10 years um, throughout the entire period in which the Soviet Union was inside Afghanistan. And it continued uh, because the presidential finding that authorized the program had two particular goals. One was the removal of the Soviets from Afghanistan, and the second was the removal of the Soviet-sponsored government of then of, of Najibullah. Um, I wound up running sort of the last part of this, the last three or four years of this um, from Pakistan at a time when our own relations with the Pakistani government were, to say the least, strained because of the invocation of something called the Pressler Amendment, where the president had to certify every year that Pakistanis were not building a nuclear weapon. And we had very clear intelligence that they were continuing to build a nuclear weapon. They had exceeded all of the so-called red lines. So military assistance to Pakistan was cut off. And then I'm sitting out there trying to figure out how to continue running this program with the Pakistani government. And in the meantime, we had something called um, negative symmetry where both sides, both we and the Soviet Union, and then the Soviet Union, agreed that we would stop supporting our mutual um, partners, the Mujahideen on the ground in Afghanistan, and in the Soviet case, the Najibullah government. But, uh, it was an agreement without any enforcement mechanism, so the Soviets did not stop supporting Najibullah, but we did stop supporting the Mujahideen, which caused quite a few problems for us in the field. But let me talk about the program a little bit in, you know, in general terms. You have a multi-billion dollar program, uh, sounds very expensive, sounded very expensive to me at the time, and an incredible budget, uh, which I was worried about every single day, uh, making sure that you know, I can account for everything um, involving the supply of thousands of tons of weaponry, equipment, food, clothing, everything to the Muj in the field. Um, none of which was American origin, by the way. It was all Soviet packed or Warsaw packed origin equipment, except for uh, the Stinger anti aircraft missile, which basically changed the war uh, and prevented the Soviets from doing the kind of low level bombing that they were, that they were so fond of. Um, but it's huge, incredible budget, which, you know, if you look at America's own experience later in Afghanistan, was probably <laughs> the entire program probably cost about two months of our effort in Afghanistan when we went in with the American military. So it wasn't all that expensive. The other amazing thing about it is that I don't think at any one time in the 10 year war, we had any more than about 50 people involved in supporting this entire effort. The biggest part of the effort was done by the agency's incredible support staff and logistics people who were able to clandestinely acquire weaponry all over the, all over the Warsaw Pact um, without the Soviets being aware of it and, then sh and, and from China, frankly, and shipping it into the Afghans uh, through the Pakistanis. Part of the agreement that we made when the Pakistanis asked us to get involved in this program was that the Pakistanis would handle the direct relations with the Mujahideen. We would not be directly involved with them. We couldn't give the weapons to them directly, for example. We had to provide everything through Pakistan. We made our own way and we made our own relations with the Afghans over time, but we had to be very much aware of Pakistani restrictions. But anyway, you got a multi-billion dollar program. Um, we provided about three fifths of the funding over 10 years. The, the Saudis provided the other two fifths. Bill Casey used to talk about his annual Hajj to Saudi Arabia to drum up money for the program. Um, and that was always kind of interesting to watch, a process in which agreements would be made, money would be technically transferred to someplace, and months would go by before we saw any of the money. So, you know, various people were 
were investing the money for themselves as it moved through this incredible Saudi bureaucracy, but eventually the money would come. Um, it was an incredible effort all the way around. Very, we had very few people in the field. Um, I had a you know comparatively large station and a large staff. Uh, when you you know in, in terms of the normal CIA presence in a station or in, in an embassy, but in, in terms of what we did later in other countries, it was very small, um, very few people. Very difficult to find people who speak Dari and Pashtu, et cetera, but we had them. They were ordinary American case officers who grew beards, wore shawa kameez, walked in the same kind of sandals that the Afghans walked in and worked with them directly. Um, it was risky uh, going anywhere near the frontier area or going into Afghanistan in some cases to retrieve material and weapons. We had, a, as a corollary to the program, we had an incredible Sovmat, Soviet materials collection effort in which our Afghan allies would bring us Soviet material from the battlefield and we could ship it back to the United States for exploitation at Wright-Patterson by the Air Force to figure out their latest technology that the Soviets were, were using in the field. Um, it was also interesting for me because I was later involved in Bosnia and various other places where I saw Soviet style tactics used again. And, and now we're seeing the same thing in the Ukraine. It was always the same mistakes. The Soviets don't have non-commissioned officers that of the level of a Western army. They, they don't have a very good logistics system. They don't have a very good command and control system. In the, in the case of Afghanistan, many of the Soviet soldiers couldn't even speak Russian because they were from Central Asia. They spoke Central Asian languages and they were Muslim. And they were in many cases very sympathetic to the Afghans and they hated their own officers. Um, it was an incredibly uh, an interesting time, um, but it was also incredibly frustrating. I knew very well that the Pakistanis were encouraging Arabs from, from and, and other Muslims from throughout the world to come into Pakistan to join what the Pakistanis were touting as the universal jihad. Um, and those people later became um, of some interest. Thousands, hundreds of them showed up in, in Bosnia later, for example, but they were, they were recruited and trained in Afghanistan. Um, by the way, you know, none of us in the agency ever had any contact with Osama bin Laden. Right. Uh, when, when I was there, he was not even in Pakistan or Afghanistan. Uh, he had left in about 89, I think. Um, and at the time he left, he was an engineer. He was not involved in any direct military support or, or fighting or any, any of the other claims to, to greatness that he seems to acquire. It was mostly yeah. myth. The only so let me let me ask you to stop there with them. Um, we want to make sure we leave enough time for um for questions and answers. There's a whole bunch of issues we discussed before we came on that we maybe we'll get to in the Q and A. The CIA's relationship with the Senate and House Intelligence Committee, the Glomar Explorer, Incutel, which I'd like John to talk about. Uh, if we don't get a question, I will ask you about Incutel because that's a really interesting case. Um, the the CIA's relationship with the DNI. Bill helped write the legislation. John and I both testified against the legislation. Um, but we will just, uh, we're going to have to put all those on the shelf for the time being. Um, John uh, McLaughlin is going to give us some remarks on where we've been talking about the past of the CIA. John's going to give some observations about the future of the CIA. And then the panelists will all come back and we'll be open for a Q&A with the audience. So John, over to you. Great. Thanks, Mark. And I'll try and get us to Q&A as fast as possible. Uh, let me just give you four quick thoughts about the future which will be challenging. Every period the CIA has gone through has been challenging, but this future will be even more so. There are four points that come to mind for me. The first is establishing priorities in a world that's gone a little crazy. In other words, uh, there are so many issues on the table, all of them interlinked, all of them joined together in a way that has never been the case before, that figuring out where to put your focus when you can't do everything around the globe 24 hours a day with equal uh, effort? How do you divide the world into the things that are urgent, the things that are important, 
the things that are emerging and the things that you have to just pay attention to on a lower priority basis. That's going to be tough with the world ahead. China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, climate change, you name it, pandemic, all of that. Second thing I'd mention is that it's going to be more difficult, already is, to maintain what we call clandestinity, that is to operate secretly, particularly in the human um, human collection, uh, agent collection realm, in a world that is uh, awash in CCTV, biometric identification, GPS, uh, and, and all of that, uh, making it much harder. The, the days when you could move around the world with a pocket full of passports uh, is gone. So challenges there that I know the agency is meeting, but they're only going to become more difficult. Uh, third, I would say integrating all these new technologies that are burgeoning now and that our competitors are deeply into. The two that are probably most prominent are artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, these are technologies that are not now novel, but they require a lot of effort to integrate them into your effort. And the reason they have to be is that they have the capacity to deal with volume. You know, if you went back um, in history, it took 400 years to go from the printing press uh, to, um, uh, to the telephone, to the telegraph. But it's taken only 25 years to go from no cell phones in the world, no smartphones to, you know, four or five billion. And so the volume of material is such that you need these technologies to help you find the patterns in them. When you look back, as I have recently at some intelligence failures, usually a cause is that critical information is lost in volume. And therefore, these technologies and artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all their kin have to be integrated into our effort. And finally, I would just say, this isn't so much a challenge as it is a, a benefit and um, a challenge of sorts. And that is that the world of what we call open source intelligence is exploding. Um, Don talked about the beginning of the satellite era when CIA essentially invented imagery from space, which now, of course, we get on our phones. Uh, and we see in the New York Times and the Washington Post every day because commercial imagery companies are available for hire. Uh, analytic services are developing all over the United States and the world that do this and do it quite skillfully. Some recent discoveries by people without clearances, but using these open source uh, methods, such as, for example, advances in the Chinese nuclear uh, program, open source intelligence, um, present the CIA with uh, both an opportunity and a challenge. The opportunity is to take advantage of this and integrate it into our work. The challenge is that it becomes even harder to do what we do best, which is to add value to what the intelligence customer, the policymaker is getting, to give that customer what um, we've always called decision advantage. And we will continue to do that but uh, we should be aware that uh, we don't own the world of information as much as we have in the past. So those are four challenges that I think uh, uh, we welcome uh, because the CIA has always done best when it has been challenged. It's the ingenuity and innovation and inventiveness of, of all the trailblazers that we honor at the CIA that I think will be called upon here in the future. And over to you, Mark. I'm going to invite the panelists to uh, rejoin us, and uh, we're going to take our questions uh, from the audience. The audience. Amanda Elke of the uh, Spy Museum will be moderating the question. David's back with us as well. Good. So, uh, Amanda, over to you, and we will sort of uh, field these as we can. Yes, and we have so many amazing questions that have come in throughout, so we'll, we'll do our best in our remaining time. Uh, one that came in very early that I thought you would enjoy. Um, the intelligence community often receives blame for not predicting events. However, recently with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it was predicted and shared publicly. So do you think the CIA and the rest of our intelligence community receive enough credit for what is currently predicted? Don't worry, all the questions aren't this nice. Um, I'm not sure, John, you wanna take this one first? Well, I, I think uh, 
in that case, the CIA certainly does deserve credit. One of the difficulties of talking about success and failure in intelligence is that failures, when they occur, are often very visible and unavoidable. Successes occur, <clears throat> you don't hear about them for a number of reasons. Sometimes it's a secret, but also sometimes you don't hear about a success because nothing happened. In other words, think back to the example Bill gave of preventing an ambassador from being blown up. No one knew that that had been prevented. Uh, an instance I remember from my time in the uh, uh, last year or two of my tenure was uh, calling uh, Secretary of State and saying, there's an embassy in the region, uh, a part of the world that was in flames at the time, that is going to receive a terrorist attack. And you need to take precautions or evacuate the embassy. Turned out to be correct. No one knows about that. Uh, so a lot of successes occur when nothing happens. And successes of intelligence are woven into the fabric of successful policies. And is that one, one of the Washington sayings is there are policy successes and there are intelligence failures and it never goes the other way. No, we are here to support policy makers. I just finish that off by saying uh, the CIA is not defensive when there is a failure. The CIA goes to school on its failures. So, um, and as Mark pointed out at the beginning, it's a risk-taking organization. <clears throat> Look it up. Risk implies failure. Without the possibility of failure, it's not a risk. Right. And that extends to analysis as well as operations. It's important Absolutely. to keep that in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Amanda? All right. Um, this is really very interesting because it's history and present and future. CIA prepared a climate report in August 1974. What was the original instigation for that um, and its relation to intelligence who prepared that? Has the agency continued to prepare climate reports and do they hold any detail significant to potential global warming? Now, John, I think you're the only one with history going back that far no, on I, the anal analytics side. I don't recall that. Maybe uh, Andy has something on that. I, I don't recall that specific report in 1974, but it's no surprise to me that the CIA years and years and years ago was writing national estimates alerting the world to the potential for pandemic, for example. So bear in mind, the, the standard the CIA uses, which I learned from Bob Gates, is your highest priority always goes to things that threaten the physical security of the United States or the lives of American citizens. So CIA officers would naturally think of climate change or pandemic. Now, in recent years, I don't have it at my fingertips here, but there has been a, um, uh, an estimate of sorts uh, done on climate change. And I'm sure maybe Andy can affirm that that is, uh, has been delivered to the agency as a top priority for its, its uh, certainly its analytic work and certainly its uh, scientific uh, component can, can contribute to it. Andy? Yeah, John, uh, just real quick. Um, uh, the, the, the work that's done at the agency is looking at the implications of climate change, right? And not so much the, you know, is the climate going to change, not change, but but sort of going forward and saying, okay, what, you know, what if there's water shortages, you know, what does that mean for societies that are, you know, barely sort of existing today, crop failures, you know, what kind of unrest does that cause? So there's been a, a fair amount of that kind of work done looking at the models that project, you know, where in fact climate change may, may have the biggest impacts and then trying to assess sort of what's the political nature of what happens in those places. And does it lead to war conflicts? Who might get involved? So, uh, there's been a fair amount of that over the last um, probably decade um, that's gone on. It ebbs and flows, depending on the interests of the policymakers. But there's been a fair amount of that kind of work done. Thanks. Yeah, man. All right. Changing pace, asking about the workforce today um, with younger um, members entering who are expected to have multiple jobs in their life. How can the CIA, how can in the intelligence field keep people around so that they can build on their experience rather than Andy, leaving? You were, the, you were the COO. I'm going to give this to you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, that's a really good question. I, I think the, the shift that the agency is, is trying to undertake now, it, and, and I think I saw the question, and it's, you know, it, it used the, the phrase cradle the grave, and that's the way most of us who are on the screen uh, even though we're, thankfully we're not in the grave yet, um, 
you know, the approach was, you know, you join the agency, you stay there for decades and then you retire. Um, you know, not so much anymore, right? That's not the model. And so the, the, the shift is starting to go on in the, in the agency is, you know, we have to sort of do this thing where we let people leave for a period of time and make it clear that they're welcome back. Mm -hmm. That, you know, the, the, pro, the process will be, you know, still there has to be an investigation, the, the background investigation, all those things still have to go on, but it'll be done in an expedited fashion simply because they had clearances before, you know, they go out and work in the private sector. I have to be honest, that some of the most successful people now at the, sort of the more senior ranks at the agency have had this experience where they worked, left some of them for a decade, and then came back and brought a wealth of information mm -hmm. back and made the, made the agency better. It's just a matter of getting that kind of mindset through the, the leadership, the senior leadership, the director, the deputy director, co completely on board. Sometimes you get into the middle and, you know, those folks, maybe not so much, but but it's an evolution. But I think that's the workforce you're going to see. You're going to see it more of a, 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 a workforce that spends time at the agency, leaves and then returns. And, and this is going to be an issue across the intelligence community. So if you hire people, for example, as John was saying, to keep track of technology, technology is moving really, really fast. So and, and John probably can speak this more than I can. You hire somebody that converses with technology and then we, you know, they're immured inside their agency, whether it's CIA or NSA, they're not conversant after five years. You don't fire them, but how do you get somebody else who's more up to speed? And so we're gonna to have to do something rotational. Dawn, you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I think this is my big Incutel cue right here. Yes, for go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the agency was, you know, a leader in, in developing and devising relationships with, with venture capitalists specifically to understand what was going on from a commercial perspective. And also we put people into Incutel um, as IPAs and SGEs and Incutel does the same thing. We're working on, uh, or we, at least we were when I was leaving, we were working on bringing that expertise into government for specifically the reasons that you cite so that people are current um, and can come back or are bringing in their currency and helping apply it to mission. So I think we're looking at uh, a lot of flexible ways to um, bring that currency in through the organization. And InQtel was very overtly a big piece of that to understand what's going on and, and understand how to leverage it. And in, in some cases, put together work programs so that the company will take on a problem that will actually benefit CIA mission without necessarily specifying how that would happen. Uh, another timely question is about disinformation, sponsored disinformation. Um, is this an agency objective? Um, is there interagency cooperation, uh, you know, combating disinformation or the, the speaker or the questioner wants to know if this is more of an FBI matter? Hmm. Who feels comfortable with this question? Oh, I, would just, I would just add, um, you know, if you work at CIA, uh, long before disinformation was a household word, you had to worry about deception. In, in other words, uh, adversaries uh, are always trying to insert deception messages into the, the information you're gathering. And sometimes this has worked. Uh, when we've had intelligence failures, it's often been because we misinterpreted something or we, we looked at a, uh, uh, for example, um, a Soviet army maneuvering on the border of Czechoslovakia and mistook it for um, a maneuver that was their intention to deceive us, and it turned out to be the invasion of Czechoslovakia, 1968. So uh, there's a mindset at the agency to always be looking for deception. In that sense, uh, I'm not working there now, but I'm quite certain that agency specialists are working with those in the government at the FBI and at uh, Homeland Security who are um, alert to the possibility of uh, disinformation filtering into our network. Also, of course, uh, disinformation that is sponsored by foreign adversaries like the Chinese or the Iranians or the Russians that seeking to uh, influence our elections. Uh, I'm quite certain that the agency contributes to the understanding of that. And, um, um, you know, again, Don may want to comment here, but our, our technical people, uh, I'm certain, are looking at the issue of deep fakes. 
that are embedded in um, various media that come through. Uh, those are all things you have to understand if you're at CIA. So I think the basic answer is yes, but we're not the lead agency on that. But you, you, anyone who's working on that and doesn't consult CIA is missing uh, the boat, I think. If I could jump in here, um, one thing it would behoove everybody involved with this issue of disinformation and deception is to realize that it's nothing new. Uh, the Soviets have been up to this throughout the Cold War. The Russians have continued it. Uh, they've tried to influence elections. They've had a, a massive international disinformation network. Uh, they were the ones who came up with the AIDS hoax, uh, the body parts, uh, disinformation, uh, allegations, and so forth. The Reagan administration did something that I think we should do much more aggressively than we are now. If you, in an attempt to counter Soviet disinformation, it set up something called the Active Measures Working Group, mm -hmm. which was out there for the purpose of publicizing disinformation and discrediting it. Now, ideally, what you want to do is get ahead of the curve by penetrating the enemy covert action apparatus and figure out what they're going to do ahead of time so you can preemptively counter it. That would be the ideal way to use do offensive disinformation, if you want to put it that way. Uh, we have, Historically, we've been a little weak in that arena. But I think if we did more to publicize the disinformation that uh, our adversaries are perpetuating through social media, we would be better off than we are now and not seem like we're always going off the back foot when these things happen. Bill, did you want to say something? Yeah, I served in India in the late 70s, and the Soviets at that time used the Indian press as their outlet to the rest of the world. They would create right. some story like the AIDS story, and they put it in some remote or some little known Soviet scientific publication somewhere, attributed it to A. Smith, well-known doctor who nobody had ever heard of. And the next thing you know, it would appear in a newspaper in India, and then it was eventually all over the world. They placed so much stuff <clears throat> into the Indian press that they used to refer to the Indian uh, press publications as TAS South. <laughs> um, now they've they've gone into more sophisticated routes since then, but it you know as as David said, it's it's been part and parcel of the the Russian bag of tricks since they started the um, Protocol of the Elders of Zion, which was mm -hmm. another huge fraud perpetrated by the Tsarist government, and then continues to have echoes, particularly all over side. the Muslim world. On the other side of the coin, we can take some pride in the fact that CIA has successfully disseminated in the past, uh, and presumably still today, uh, accurate information. I mean, CIA, uh, remember, Radio Free Europe was initially a CIA operation, and it was the cover was blown in the 1970s, but up till then, it was a CIA operation, very successful. Mm -hmm. uh, we had book programs to get books behind the Iron Curtain during the Cold War. We actually got a copy, a manuscript copy of Dr. Zhivago, um, mm -hmm. which was banned in the Soviet Union and managed to get it printed by a proprietary and disseminated it all over the the uh, the Iron Curtain countries. So, you know, I, I, we have to remind ourselves occasionally when we're searching for disinformation that we're pretty good at getting the right story out as well. Um, switching gears, I know we're running out of time, and I want, I want the audience to know that I'm going to share, we're going to share the questions that didn't get answered with the panel who may choose to, to answer them uh, if they wish to, but squeezing in a couple more. I liked this. Uh, can the panel expand on the issues and successes with creating cover for technical collection? Because I, I think that's such an interesting project. Yeah, I guess that would be my cue. I'll start with that, <laughs> Mark, if that's all right. Um, no, so please, yes. We didn't get a chance to talk about um, Glomar, for example. But, you know, it, it takes, if you think about the human element, we do exactly the same thing, thing for these um, technical programs in small or big. But Glomar is an interesting example where we found an eccentric billionaire who is willing to say that he was going to do deep sea uh, mining and use that as cover to recover part of a Soviet missile sub in the early 70s, right? 
And so if you think about um, creating cover for action from a human perspective, that translates very, very directly into cover for action from a technical collection perspective. And so that's that's one example. There are uh, you know numbers of others. I think Jim could talk a lot about, he, he created cover companies in order to be able to take down AQCon. AQCon created cover companies in, in order to be able to steal technology that was important to his work. So this is a game again that has gone on for a very, very, very long time. And if you wanna do something clandestine but big, you've gotta have really strong cover so that you have a reason for people to be collecting or capabilities to be collected. Jim, you want to answer that? Well, she's right. We did have to create a number of uh, entities overseas uh, because we were trying to get into the supply lines of these proliferant programs, and we were successful. When you get out there and you hold yourself out as a supplier of certain crucial technologies, you build the field and the people will come, and they did. And that's how we used it for both foreign intelligence collection and if I could say uh, for sabotage techniques and ultimately putting things into uh, programs that would not work the way <clears throat> they thought they would work. In fact, we jokingly said that in my unit, we took the reverse of the Hippocratic Oath. We always did harm. <laughs> um, how counterintelligence doesn't get, you know, enough love you know how successful do you think the cia has has been over its 75 years and and how is the agency positioned to meet future challenges like to just a that. little question a little yeah, question a little question yeah i'll take a stab at it because uh ahead, one, of my, one of my uh, best pocket projects at the agency is trying to understand james angleton um, part, of the problem, part of the problem with counterintelligence is that we don't have any community consensus on what it is. When you think about what a number of the agencies in the IC do, it's really just security. Uh, they, they try to screen people coming in, they try to vet them once they're in, they do infosec and, and that. And then when a problem arises, they investigate it uh, in a policeman-like fashion. But they're not engaged in offensive counterintelligence, which is an aggressive effort to turn the enemy back against himself by penetrating him and passing disinformation through double agents and penetrations like moles and such. Um, the offensive side has tended to be very parochial. Uh, the agency does it, but it was kind of a slow learner uh, in getting to it. The FBI has always done it quite adeptly. Certain military services have been very good at it. Um, part of it, too, is the the problem of dealing with the American resistance to uh, heightened security and counterintelligence awareness. The cliche of see something, say something gets a little tiresome when you start thinking that everybody's ratting you out for the most minor infractions, and they're also doing it, and so why aren't they getting into trouble? It's, a, it's almost a psychological problem in America, and we tend to swing back and forth between too much and too little, which is one reason why we have these periodic spy uh, breakouts about every 10 years, another year of the spy pops up because we've gone lax and they've taken advantage of it. And then we go severe and that lasts a few years until people get tired of having their bags checked and, and such. And so we're back in the, uh, uh, the, uh, the laxity one. We've never really come up with the right balance between a culture of trust and a culture of suspicion. It's just part of the American psyche that uh, we're just gonna have to live with because spies, as we know, are always with us and always will be right now as we're talking. The U.S. intelligence community is multiply penetrated by a number of hostile actors. Uh, we just have to put up with it and try to be more offensive and get ahead of the game. In the aftermath of the year of the spy, the Senate Intelligence Committee did a report, and it was not a glowing rec uh, report. And their final recommendation was only hire reliable people. <laughs> oh, gee, that that's really thanks, guys. That's really no. We go out to try and hire unreliable people. Uh, you know, as David said, I, I remember when um Bob Gates saying that when he became the director. He went to see former directors for advice and, and Dick Helm said to him, never stop looking for the spot. Mm -hmm. This is this is one of the costs of hiring human beings mm -hmm. that inevitably there are going to be some people who go bad on you. And the, the goal is to try and find them as quickly as possible without becoming paranoid, as many of us believe James Angleton did. Yeah, I, I actually think it's the hardest thing we do. Uh, yes. Because, um, at the CIA and in any intelligence organization, but particularly in ours, and because we live in an open free society, 
uh, we we tend to trust each other because for one thing, it's hard to get in and you're in the foxhole with these people um, you know, putting your hand in the fire figuratively or literally uh, all the time and you tend to trust your colleagues. So it's always a shock uh, when one goes bad. And when one goes bad, it tends to paralyze uh, the community for a while. And mm -hmm. also, uh, going back to something we discussed earlier, make the clearance process much more complicated. You know, one of the things that everything is contextual in the intelligence community. People say, for example, we were not uh, sharing information as well as we should have at the time of 9-11. Well, in truth, we were sharing it better than most people believe, but not good enough. One of the context pieces is that it was in the early part of that year that um, that we caught either Rick Ames or Robert Hansen, uh, one of those two major spy cases. And, Hansen. Uh, Hansen. And when that happens, uh, it tends to tighten up the system. In turn, you know, the, the system goes um, from uh, responsibility to share, which is where you want it to be, to need to know very quickly. And... Um, I just think it's the hardest thing we do, but mm -hmm. it, it does require, our, to use a hackneyed phrase, really constant vigilance that stops just short of paranoia. Hey, John, can I just, you're, one of the points that you made in your, your challenges was uh, integrating tech into our work. And this is an area where I think the appropriate integration of technology can help us get ahead, spot patterns that you normally wouldn't spot, and, and, and help us understand that something might be awry. Look, when you know when you and I joined, you know we had file cabinets and you sort of know it was in your file cabinet, I knew it was in mine. It, it's a lot trickier to, de to determine what someone's doing, but today with everything sort of monitored, you know, you can get an early indication that something is awry. And so back to your point, that's a challenge. And I think that can also help mitigate some of the, the, the risks because the risks today are much higher moving information today compared to moving information when you and I sort of joined, which was difficult and it was cumbersome and, you know, it wasn't easy to, to take a, a lot of information. Now it's simple, right? In many ways. So I think we, you have to leverage that technology that you talked about as one of your challenges. Great point. Um, we've had, I don't know if this is a, a wrapping up question, but we've had, Several people, I have reassured them in writing, but uh, other people have been concerned about things that were talked about here today and their classification. So <laughs> would um, you like to reassure our audience? Yes, um, we, our, we, we, people had their remarks reviewed before we, before we came on the panel. The CIA was cognizant and was supportive of doing the panel. We have not, I do not believe we've just said anything that was classified. Um, we've been, look, we, all of us have done this before. We're very, very careful. John teaches, I teach, um, Bill teaches. We all know the parameters, the left-right guidance. And so, no, we have, we have been very careful about what we say and how we say it. Um, and I also know that George Jameson has asked, um, the audience can respond to the email you'll get from the Spy Museum and we will share it with everyone any ideas or topics you have for future programs for CII, CIRA, or the Spy Museum. All right, um, I wanna th thanks to my fellow panelists for taking the time to be with us tonight. Thanks to the Spy Museum for hosting us. The Spy Museum will be po posting this on their website. So just check in with the, CI with the Spy Museum's website to see our, YouTube, our YouTube, our YouTube channel. I'm oh, no, sorry, you, our YouTube channel. I apologize. Uh, thanks to CII and Sierra who are the sponsors, and also thanks to the CIA who gave us uh, support in in running up this. So thank you all, and good night. Good night, everyone.